Welcome back again to Continuum Meditations Discusses. I uh, wanted to start off by saying that it's good to be back watching The Exorcist second season. The premiere was entitled Chapter 2, Janus, and I was uh, intrigued by this uh, particular episode, and I wanted to talk a little bit about perhaps where some of things might be going for this particular season. Now, as we start off in this um, in this season, we started off with a not with a, uh, a minor little introduction. We started off jumping right into the swing of things. Marcus and Tomas are on the road together. It has been six months since the end of last season. Marcus is thoroughly training. Tomas to be an exorcist, and as usual, per what we saw last season, or from last season, Tomas is somewhat, anyway, resisting some of the instruction that Marcus is attempting to give him with respect to this profession. Uh, as we start off, we are no longer in Chicago per season one. We are now in Jefferson County, Montana. Tomas and Marcus are on the run. Uh, from an irate individual who, whose spouse they have effectively taken without the permission of the family to perform an exorcism. The woman's name is Cindy and she has been possessed apparently because she lost a child somewhere recently after her baby was born and now because of that she has been taken over by a demonic entity uh, which has used this particular circumstance to ride into her life and take control of her. This is one of two locations that we're in at this moment. The other location is uh, Knackburn Island, Washington, that is Washington State. Now I'm going to just introduce what we know of the characters so far at this point. We have five, six different characters, if I counted correctly in this particular uh, season. Uh, there's the character of Andrew Kim, who is played by the actor John Cho. There is the character of Verity, the character of Caleb, Shelby, Grace, Truck, and then the last character we have is a character by the name of Rose, who is a social worker and apparently a former love interest of Andrew Kim. And these are not the only characters that I understand are going to show up for this season. My understanding is that they are going to be continuing to explore another part of the storyline of The Exorcist that was taking place in the last season. That is the conspiracy against the Catholic Church. And that, of course, culminated in the conspiracy to try to assassinate Pope Sebastian last season, which was unsuccessful thanks to the interventions of Marcus and several other characters in the storyline, some of whom who are no longer with us in terms of being alive in the story. Also, this is uh, going to take place with, with respect to Father Devin Bennett, whom you, some of you may remember from last season as well, as the very charismatic, intellectual, diplomatic style priest, who also surprisingly to me turned out to be a warrior in his own regard. He is going to be in this season as well, but he's not going to show up until later. And there's going to be one other character whom we have not yet seen, who is also going to show up as part of this season's events. She who is also going to be, I, I believe, anyway, associating herself with Father Bennett. Uh, she is going to be with him, I believe, at the Vatican this year in, this season, in that part of the storyline that will take place. We will not be seeing, at least from what I understand so far, some of you may remember the Rance family from last season. None of them will be showing up this year. We are focusing entirely on a new case this year. That case, of course, right now is the case of this woman named Cindy. Now. I don't know that if we're dealing with the same demon who is also affecting or will ultimately affect those individuals in Washington State. It's my opinion at this point right now that we may be dealing, I believe anyway, with two separate and distinct demonic entities, one or both of whom may be communicating with the other. Now we have seen evidence of this from the past season and so we know that these entities are capable of communicating with one another that is of course they are capable of communicating with one another but we know that they are capable of laying plans with one another 
in accordance with a greater scheme to carry out events designed to thwart the designs and the plans of God and to upset human institutions, human laws, and individual and collective human beings' lives. So, the characters, basic personalities have been established, the uh, circumstances of their lives that could lead them into uh, demonic uh, oppression or demonic possession or perhaps some form of demonic influence have been laid out in the storyline. We definitely have, for example, Verity, who is uh, a young girl who is just about to turn 18 years old in about three months time according to the storyline and she at that time will be considered an adult and she is obviously as we can see somewhat concerned about that we are also able to see that she is I guess you could say the cynic of the group she is definitely she definitely has something of an attitude uh, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad attitude, but she definitely has something of an attitude. She has something, she's something of an acerbic individual. Then you have Truck, as I said before, who is definitely the, the gentle giant of the group and perhaps something of the goofball. And more about his character, we can see uh, apparently also that he is a sleepwalker. This may lead him open to possibly being, to, to having his mind influenced by the demon that is dealing with this particular family in that uh, he may be open to suggestion uh, from this entity at some subconscious or unconscious level. Uh, we're probably obviously going to learn more about him as the story goes on. And then you have the blind kid, Caleb, who I don't, I don't have as much insight about at this point except that he definitely wants to be out of the, social, uh, the foster care social uh, system. He is looking for his father to come back and take custody of him so he can go live with his father. That is obviously a point of contention and concern because his father has not shown up for custody hearings. His father has not made any contact with him, at least not any kind of real deep and abiding contact. And so this is something of a concern to Caleb that uh, apparently Andrew Kim the foster father is going to be trying to deal with in the course of these events. Then you have the uh, kid Shelby and from what I can see Shelby not only is a person of faith himself he's obviously leading the family sometime, at least from time to time in prayers over dinner and things of that nature but Shelby also seems to be some, something uh, of a person who might be something of a sensitive. I'm not entirely sure of this yet, but he, from the preview that we get from second, uh, uh, from this upcoming week's episode, it looks like Shelby uh, is somewhat sensitive to spiritual things or maybe psychic things, if, if you will. I don't know which one of those might be correct, but he says he senses some kind of danger or he's scared about something. Perhaps he is aware at some kind of unconscious or subconscious level that there is something else going to be going on in that house besides just normal natural events. Now the other side of that of course is he somewhat also seems to be something of a leader of the group as well besides Verity. They, I think they might be two of the oldest groups, uh, two of the oldest of the group there, although they are, they are all virtually pretty much within the same age group. Verity is obviously the oldest, but I'm getting the impression that Shelby is the second oldest, perhaps followed by Truck, then perhaps Caleb, and obviously the young girl Grace is the last person who, uh, of age. She is the youngest of the group. So Shelby, in my opinion, looks like he's going to be the person who is going to be able to sense what is going on around him perhaps the most. Uh, he looks like he's a person who's going to be spiritually sensitive to what is happening and maybe because of his spiritual adeptness, perhaps because of his ability to discern things, he might be one of the people who first gets an idea of what's happening around him before anybody else does. Then you have the blind kid Caleb. You've already seen from the first story that somehow or another his mind has been influenced by something that is going on whatever is going on there obviously it's some kind of entity happen uh, you know that is that is getting ready to attack this family is doing so subtly right now and sooner or later of course the, that subtlety will become more overt and out in the open the last person the last child of the group is the little girl grace now we know that children are traditionally in these types of storylines they are traditionally more sensitive to 
uh, extra dimensional entities than adults are. Their minds are not as uh, set as as adults are. They are more malleable in their thought processes than adults are, and they're more open to the world and to new ideas and experiences, etc., etc., than adults are. Grace appears, from what we can see, to be one of those pe persons who is going to have some form of contact with the entity where it might up try to appeal to her in a childlike manner and to earn her trust, where that way it can use that trust to ride into her mind, into her life, and perhaps try to use her for whatever purposes it may have. We've seen that from the next episode upcoming. But Grace, beyond that in her personality, she apparently is something of a reserved child. She may be something of a troubled child. She doesn't eat with the rest of the group. She doesn't really socialize with the rest of the group or interact with them. She doesn't go to school with the rest of the group the kids that is and she's she tends to stay in her room and she has this kind of funny looking pillow slip that she puts over her head which she calls which Andrew calls her brave face that she uses to try to I, I guess interact with the world at some level so we don't know exactly why Grace is like this but the little one she is the littlest one of the group but for whatever reasons this is the way she is and so these things are all coming into play. All of these issues and, and problems have been set up so that we can see not only the personalities of each of the persons involved in the storyline, but also we can see how and possibly why the demon might choose any one of them as its potential next target. Then, of course, there is the rogue element in this storyline. That is the unknown quantity, the X factor, if you will. That is the social worker Rose. Now, she not only is an ex-girlfriend, at least an ex-girlfriend, maybe she's an ex-fiance, I don't know, but she's at least an ex-girlfriend or an ex-love ex interest of Andrew Kim. But here she comes onto the scene to evaluate this family. And you couldn't have chosen, uh, from a dramatic storyline point of view, a better person to do so than a former lover of the um, of the adult of the foster father right but anyway here she comes onto the scene to evaluate the living conditions and the psychological conditions of this family and just like that weird things start happening to the family when she shows up that have never apparently anyway happened before the social worker is obviously going to start wondering why now, here's something that I wanted to raise with you that I thought would, might be interesting. I am actually thinking, as I said before, I'm thinking that there are two separate and distinct entities perhaps working together at this point. One against Marcus and Tomas in the form of Cindy in Montana, and perhaps another which is using the tail of this witch that was uh, in the area that killed kids with poison and then threw them down the well this other demonic entity is working to undo the family in Washington State. But an interesting twist I thought of as I was watching this episode. Wouldn't it be funny, and perhaps wouldn't it be an interesting uh, unexpected event, if Rose was the person who was actually possessed? And perhaps, not get, and perhaps she doesn't get possessed later on, perhaps she's already possessed, or maybe under some kind of demonic influence when she gets to the island. All these weird things didn't start uh, happening until she showed up, as a matter of fact. And so that kind of made me think to myself, hmm, maybe it's this woman who we have the issue with after all, and not one of the kids and not Andrew Kim himself. They've set this, this up, you know, quite, quite frankly, guys, in a way that you could probably think, well, could it be Verity? You'd probably say, no, she's too obvious. She's very cynical, but she's she's also very rooted in reality. Is it Truck? Uh, probably not. He's, 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 he's a gentle giant, but he doesn't seem to have that many problems. He's a goofball, but he doesn't seem to have that many psychological issues. Is it Shelby? Mm, probably not, because Shelby's really grounded in his faith and in his uh, ideas about the world, too, to a certain degree, and so he's not going to be too easily fooled, right? So probably won't be him either. So that really only leaves Caleb and the little one, Grace. So I don't think that Grace, at this point, will be a person who, who will be under the, the control of this entity. Uh, children normally, when they are 
attacked by demonic entities in these types of storylines. They are used as a means to try to undo things because they could be, the, the demons could get the child to trust them, but they don't necessarily get possessed. Um, that, of course, will leave Caleb. But again, I think Caleb might be a bit obvious too. This is why I'm thinking, is it or could it be Rose herself? So anyway, that's where I will leave you with in my uh, review slash analysis of this first episode of season two of The Exorcist. I'm happy to see this show back on the air. This is one of the few shows that I have looked forward to seeing come back on. I was pleasantly surprised but glad to see it renewed for a second season when they finally announced that this was going to happen. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention. Apparently, of course, we do see that there is a dynamic going on between Marcus and Tomas, where Tomas is questioning the techniques and the, the methodology that Marcus is teaching him. He, Marcus, uh, Tomas that is, seems to believe that he has the ability, perhaps he thinks it's a gift from God, to go into the, I guess you could say, go into the mind of a demonic entity and the mind of the person that the entity has possessed and use that as a means to try to root the demon out and to uncover some of the demon's weaknesses and to try to reach the person that has been possessed. Marcus is continually telling him that this is not the way to do it. You need to stick to the methods that I'm teaching you. They are time honored. They are time tested and you need to not be such a knucklehead and pay attention to what I'm telling you. Otherwise, you risk not only losing the battle for the person who is possessed, but you risk losing the battle for your own soul as well, which is also a part of this challenge, this test. To some degree, I think Marcus may be right in this. While this demon from this season that has possessed Cindy was trying to outwit and manipulate Marcus, one of the things you may remember or recall from last season was that the demon Pazuzu, while it was in control of Casey, was always trying to tempt Marcus in some way, to get him to join the demonic entities on the dark side. If you recall, uh, when Marcus first confronted Casey, he asked her when she was possessed, what is your name, demon? What do you want? And the demon doesn't give him its name, of course, but the demon does respond by saying, you with us. And so one of the things I'm thinking here is you saw that Marcus and Tomas were at odds with one another from the very first season. You saw they were at odds with one another over technique. You saw that they even came to fisticuffs. That is, they started fighting with one another physically, fighting with one another in one of the episodes from last season. So this is going to continue on this season, but apparently it's going to escalate to the next level. But Tomas now, in my opinion, thinks that he is learning enough or perhaps learning enough that he can start to try to apply some of his own possible techniques. Marcus is continually trying to tell him, look, you need to pay attention to what I'm telling you. This is deadly serious. And by now, you ought to know that this is deadly serious and not just take it for, for granted or take it lightly, but just because you may have some insights into what, what's going on, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are ready to just jump ship and discard my instruction, okay? Or disregard my instruction. It looks like Tomas is trying to do this already, and this does look like it is going to be a point of contention between them this season, as it was to some degree even last season. But you also see that the demon is this demon who has possessed the woman, Cindy. This demon is trying to do what Pazuzu did to Marcus last year, that is, to cast doubt in his abilities, doubt in his life, doubt in his, his life's purpose, and doubt in his skills as an exorcist. And it is going to try to use, once again, use Tomas as a means to try to drive a wedge between the, these two priests, okay, and get them to begin attacking one another instead of focusing their efforts on it, that is, the demon that has possessed Cindy. So we're going to see how this plays out uh, in this season, and I'm looking forward to watching this season. I will be looking forward to interacting with you in your thoughts about this season. So, until next time, Exorcist fans, we'll see you then.